The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley. With me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Yourself? Doing well, Father. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Glad Joining uh, Father Jenkins and myself is Mr. Thomas Condit. He is a very great friend of the program, a longtime parishioner of Immaculate Conception uh, right here in Cincinnati. He is a very well accomplished lawyer in the uh, Cincinnati area. He has fought the, the pro-life cause for many years now. And so, uh, Mr. Condit, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, definitely. So, Father Jenkins, Mr. Condit, we remain in the, the midst of this COVID-19 <coughs> crisis, the coronavirus uh, that, that we continue to fight. And this really appears to be shaping up to be a kind of a two-headed beast that, that we're fighting here. On, on the one side, we have the, uh, the virus itself and mm -hmm. the, the, the dangers that, that that poses to our, to our bodily health. And uh, on the other side, though, we have this other issue, which, which may end up being the, the, the larger issue at play here. And that is the response to this virus uh, from, from our elected government officials. I know there are... Uh, there are a lot of varying opinions on this. There, there's a lot of, of fear, um, I believe justified fear, and the fact that our, our civil liberties could, could be curtailed, uh, that there is some kind of infringement on our, on our constitutional rights as Americans. So, M Mr. Condit, as a, a professional uh, lawyer and attorney at law, I, I would like to get your your take on this in, in general, um, the, do you think that this fear is justified that we have um, in, in the curtailment of our civil liberties, our constitutional liberties, uh, by these uh, sanctions, uh, by these, these directives and orders that our, our governors across the nation are, are imposing now? So in, in, that's in general, but specifically, uh, just, just last week, we saw the, uh, the director's stay-at-home order here in, in Ohio, um, sent out by the director of, of health uh, here in Ohio. We, we spent some time talking about that in our last program with Father Jenkins, but just yesterday, actually, we saw across the border in Kentucky the uh, executive order 2020-258, from, uh, from Governor Bashir over there. And while the, the stay-at-home order in Ohio seemed to be rather benign, there were many exemptions uh, permitted uh, to, to break this stay-at-home order, the, the uh, executive order in Kentucky seems to be quite the opposite. The, the measures here seem to be as almost as severe as they could possibly be. There are very few exceptions permitted um, to this to this executive order, which rest restricts all travel out of the state by Kentucky residents. So, what is your take in general on, on the, uh, the the current that we see in the United States, but in particular on this executive order mm -hmm. from Kentucky? Right. Well, any good witness would say, could you restate the question? <laughs> <laughs> because there are about four questions in there, maybe. Uh, Serious so, issue here. Right. Right. So I, I guess my, my personal reaction, I think, mm -hmm. that is not the, you know, it's, it's a common reaction. Uh, you don't have to be a lawyer to have this reaction. In fact, in the last 24 hours, I've spent time with uh, a nurse, a um, plumber, a, another maintenance man, blue collar guys, you know, all of them have the same reaction. I think anybody that thinks conservatively Ha is going to have some of this reaction, and it, uh, but but the re the question underlying it all is what are the facts? Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. what are the facts? You can, you I'm sure we've all experienced. You click onto websites of different ideologies on the internet, and you will have some radically different headlines and emphases on what, uh, y you know, what, what what we need to do or what's overreacting. So the question is, what are the facts? And, and maybe we still don't know a lot of the facts. I mean, medically, they, they, they would say they don't know all the facts. 
But I would say, to get to my personal reaction and those I, of, I think, a lot of conservatives that, I've, that I know close and not so close, uh, is that objectively the data does not support the, the depth and the breadth of the governmental reaction to this. Okay. Um, I got a text message today, uh, and, and this is a source that I didn't pursue what, how trustworthy it is, but it's consistent with a lot of the data that we've seen. Uh, it says deaths worldwide, mm -hmm. all right, from January 1st of this year till March 25th, just sure. last week. Yeah. Coronavirus, almost 22,000. Seasonal flu, 113,000. Malaria, 228,000. Suicides, 249,000. Wow. Uh, traffic fatalities, 313,000. Uh, the numbers are going up. Yeah, you can I see. see that. HIV, AIDS, 390,000. Uh, cancer, uh, 1.9 million. And they couldn't resist abortion, 9.9 .9 million, of course. So of course. throw that one in. But, but so, so objectively speaking, the coronavirus is way at the bottom of the totem pole on this list of yeah. cause of death in the world. Sure. And we don't see, you, you know, I, I've thought if you take some of these, some of the politicians, I, 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 it might have been Governor Cuomo in New York that said, if this saves even one life, it'll be worth it. Sure. I couldn't believe he said it. Please, but President, President Obama it, said that as well. If, if that mentality was true, we're looking at 313,000 traffic fatalities. We would make people stop driving yeah. if that was true, if that was really the attitude. So objectively, there's a lot of reason to distrust what's going on here, and I think a lot of people do. So what's the appropriate reaction? Well, it, de it depends what facts you believe. And uh, even the experts, the medical experts, the uh, epidemiologists and so forth, I, 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 I don't know that any of us can know for sure, but there's a lot of reasons to, 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 to be concerned. And you know, I, you know, I've just printed a few things, stories off the internet along this line. I just want to read the headlines for a few. I mean, this is, this is conservative thinking out there. One's called overreacting to a serious situation. And this was written by a dermatologist who dealt with a lot of AIDS patients during the AIDS crisis. Um, uh, and another one is called how many lives is our national lockdown going to cost? And it talked about the other reasons people may die from having their business mm -hmm. go under, heart attacks, yeah. strokes, mm -hmm. all the stress from this. Uh, another one just called consider the costs. Uh, th this, some of these are from the American Spectator and a few other conservative mm. journals. But um, I think objectively, to just kind of wind down my answer to your question, from, from the standpoint of just the non-legal analysis, objectively there's a lot of reasons to question or even be suspicious or have they told us everything? And if not, why, uh, why are we literally appear to be willing to destroy the economy yeah. for the long run? over uh, a virus that's barely in the top 10 of death toll, you know, in the world. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. So that, that, that's the non-lawyer, the, the, the other thing, or unless you wanted to inject something there. No, no. Okay, I was gonna move on to some, no. the other thing you asked me, which was comparing the uh, orders that came out from Governor, Governor DeWine in mm -hmm. Ohio and Governor Bashir in Kentucky. Uh, Governor DeWine's order was loaded with Exceptions. Yes. Yes. Uh, so much so that I, I concluded that they didn't intend to, you know, s send out the National Guard to inspect every road and bridge, as much as they wanted to have an order out there that would have some bite if they needed it. You yeah. know, if you, if you literally had people assembling in the streets by the hundreds and uh, just kind of blatant violations of the social distancing norm and so forth. Uh, Kentucky's Governor Bashir in Kentucky is quite different. I mean, he he, he had four he had four four exceptions of why you could leave the state. Thou shalt not leave Kentucky, <laughs> yeah. and and it's 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 limited and it's addressed only to Kentucky residents, mm -hmm. and uh, it has four exceptions. And unlike Governor De the Governor Dewine, something certainly close to the hearts of the viewers here, uh, uh, one of the exceptions was not attending religious services right. in Kentucky, which strikes right at the heart of us yeah. and I think is a big problem for reasons I can maybe go into later. Definitely. Father Jenkins, with this uh, non-existent r religious exemption, what, um, 
how do you think, you know, that this hits home really for us. We have, I know, a, a lot of families, uh, even, even very large families, uh, who attend the, uh, the church here, Immaculate Conception, right across the river. How does this impact them? Do you think that this order is something that, that they should abide by? Should they refrain from coming to Mass here in Cincinnati? What, what should they do? Well, it depends on uh, what the danger is, what the threat is. I mean, if uh, Governor Andy Bashir intends to have state troopers monitoring the bridges across the Ohio River to see you know, what Kentucky license plates uh, go across the bridge out of the state and what Kentucky license plates cross the bridge back into the state, and he's going to be pulling them over and uh, examining them and, and determining whether or not they had his... Uh, you know, met his, 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 what should I say, his requirements, mm -hmm. right, to legitimately leave the state and return, well then, um, I would say they, they face a certain amount of danger. Um, he's a Democrat, and unfortunately we've seen the Democrat uh, governors tend to be much more uh, tyrannical. In the, they claim to be very liberal, but they're liberal not in the classical sense, but in more along the lines uh, as, let's say, Joseph Stalin was liberal, or... Uh, Adolf Hitler was liberal. We see that. They're all pro-abortion, right? And so why would we expect them to have any respect for any human life, especially uh, matters of religion, faith? So um, the fact that he, uh, he, I'm sure, deliberately omitted that, right? I'm sure he de deliberately omitted that exemption. Uh, means that he intends to not accept that as an excuse for leaving his state. Mm -hmm. Remember when uh, Governor Cuomo in New York, who was all in favor of murdering babies right up to birth, right? Yeah. Remember he said, I don't want any of these people in my state. I don't want any pro-lifers in my state. He said, right? That's how they think of it, right? That's, that's not uh, so much Democrat as a demagogue, although there might not be much of a distinction these days. And so... Um, yeah, I, I tend to think that those who uh, are, are facing the wrath of Andy Bashir for leaving his state uh, without his okay uh, might be risking quite a bit. Uh, under the circumstances, though, I think because of uh, President Trump's declared state of emergency because of a, a pandemic, well, that would it, one can argue the merits of that, but the fact is that that declaration. Uh, of a pandemic emergency would, I think, exempt uh, people from actually venturing out to attend Mass. I don't think they'd be committing mortal sin if they didn't do so. That's why we've taken the steps we have to uh, try to enable them to sanctify the day as well as they can at home. Mm -hmm. But uh, in any case, I, I, uh, I would not fear, um, uh, let, let's say, crossing the line in Ohio, because I think our rulers have shown that they are rather restrained. But uh, I don't have that same confidence across the river. By the way, I just heard a rumor, and unfortunately these rumors are flying around. And I mention it not because uh, I necessarily believe it's true. I think it very well might be true, though. Uh, because rumors were flying around uh, up to last Sunday as to whether there was going to be a stay-at-home stay order issued here in Ohio, and, and as a matter of fact, it came to pass. But I, I've been tell, told that this, uh, the National Guard is uh, gathering not far from here, actually just north of the city of Cincinnati. And uh, they're about to be deployed to issue a very severe uh, lockdown of everything. <clears throat> Possibly even those exempt, many of those exempt uh, exemptions made by uh, the Director of Health of Cincinnati, of Ohio. But I understand uh, particularly churches might be targeted by it, so they might be closed. Now we've done everything we could at Immaculate Conception to abide by the requirements of the Ohio State Health Department. Mm. Uh, it's quite an impressive list uh, in the protocol we followed in order to be very, very observant of uh, the intent expressed by the, uh, by the health director here in Ohio. So if it does happen, at least I'll have the uh, good conscience of knowing it's not because of anything we did or didn't do. We've tried 
truly to help. I think it, if that happens, it'll probably be because of the recklessness of others who just completely disregarded the order. Um, but I, I would think that if Governor DeWine imposes something like that, I understand that there's talk about it happening by this Sunday or sometime over this weekend. Uh, I believe that Governor DeWine would do it reluctantly and only because he was being sort of pushed to do it. I don't think he'd want to do that, though. Okay. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, just m the point is we need to pray mm -hmm. and, uh, and pray and then pray some more. Pray the rosary, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, be faithful. And then whatever occurs, we have to accept as God's will and we have to make the best of it mm -hmm. right? and for his sake. Father, with, with this executive order from, from Governor Bashir, it's very, very short. I, I printed the order off. It's only, I would say, a, a few hundred words long. But he, he explicitly states here towards the end of the order that uh, nothing in the order should be interpreted to interfere with uh, the governmental branches and their exercise of authority. Mm -hmm. and so while he, he you know, purposely uh, omits our, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the legitimate um, you know, right that we have to practice our, our religious freedom, he makes sure that he explicitly states in here that, that their government branches are still allowed to, to exercise their authority. And that, that, I think, raises the, the question of, do you believe that, that this, I know we've talked about this before, about you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. Do you think that um, governors across the nation really are using this crisis kind of as, a, uh, kind of as, a, as an excuse to, to exercise this, just this abuse of power? I, mean, I think some governors are. Yeah. I think some governors are. I think some governors have gotten a good taste of power. Yeah. They can snap their fingers and entire populations, you know, are confined to quarters uh, under house arrest, <laughs> practically. Um, some of the governors, uh, Democrats, uh, and actually some of the women governors, too, seem to be very, very inclined to say, you know, there'll be massive fines if you do this, and if you dare do this, and you dare do this, you'll pay a terrible price for it. So um, I think they've gotten a little bit intoxicated with the power that this has given to them, uh, to say the least. But power does intoxicate, and, and that, especially certain personalities who that, tend that, to go into politics. That raises the question, <laughs> Father, what, what, what motivation do they have to put an end to this crisis? I mean, it almost seems that they have you know, a, a motivation to keep the crisis. Well, there's a certain momentum there, isn't yeah. there? And a certain uh, yeah, incentive, incentive to keep it going. That's, that's what people fear. They, they fear this is, not, this is going to go on. It's going to be self-perpetuating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not letting a, a good crisis go to waste, well, we can always find another, another crisis if we need one to, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, consolidate our power even more. Yeah. That's why when I, when I say that I think Governor DeWine, I don't think he's like that. I don't think he's intoxicated with his power. Um, I think he's very restrained, and I, I think he uh, tries not to use it, if he, uh, you know, to, to impose it unless he feels constrained to do so. Uh, he could be feel constrained because whatever it is he he has given are being f uh, flouted, or because perhaps other governors are uh, you know, he's being pressed some, by somebody, being pressured into it. Um, so I, I don't know. You know, Tom, when all is said and done, I mean, let's face it. This is a a moral crisis, right? This whole thing, as I pointed out before, and I think. People generally agree, uh, at least you know those who have any faith, that this is a moral crisis brought on by, by sin. I mean, when I said that if the worst comes to pass, I mean the worst totalitarianism comes to pass, as a result of this, um, it'll make the virus seem to be almost like a footnote compared to the 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 ravage of. Uh, distress throughout the entire world, and as you say, the deaths that will be experienced and the suffering that will be imposed throughout the world by tyranny. But uh, we'll have to accept responsibility for it. I mean, there are four sins that cry to heaven for vengeance. And first on the list is wanton murder, notably of the most innocent and defenseless abortion. Are we guilty? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Millions upon millions of babies have been condemned to die miserably, horribly, 
right, in their mother's wounds, by, well, I'd have to say by the American people, or in the name of the American people, right? And that's a fact, and uh, there's no way to get around that. I mean, uh, Donald Trump has been asked, President Trump has been asked, well, or at least people have been asking about him or accusing him. He's got blood on his hands, blood on his hands because of the way he's dealing with this. Blood on his hands? The people who are actually raising that should be, I mean, if they had any sense of shame, they, they think they'd die of shame. The, the blood on their hands of these abortionists, I mean, Nancy Pelosi and, and Chuck Schumer and the rest of them, I mean, they're, they're just swimming in blood, right? And they have the nerve to, to say that. It's incredible. Just incredible. You know? But then you have the, the, the next of the uh, capital sins, and that is uh, perversion, sexual perversion, sodomy. That's, the, that's another sin that cries to heaven for vengeance. And we have sodomites now reading stories in our libraries to our little children under the supervision of their, their parents. I mean, how perverted and sick can you get? And yet, very little is done about it. Very little public reaction about it. Now, I mean, this is just the, 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 the latest manifestation of this. I wouldn't, well, I'm sure there are other manifestations that have come past that have actually surpassed that. But I mean, this is a long history of perversion that we have cultivated in our society. And uh, that, in some ways, is worse than aborting the children, you know, in some ways. Because to send them to limbo is one thing, to send them to hell is another. To pervert the innocence of their mind. Bishop Sheen used to say that the difference between a, a bad man and an evil man is that a bad man profits from the, the, the bad things he does, but the evil man just rejoices in the destruction of the innocence mm -hmm. that is there. And certainly that's what we're dealing with here. And that's why this sin cries to heaven for vengeance. And then, of course, you have the oppression of the, of the poor, you know, uh, the oppression of the, the poor, the widow, the, the orphan, right, and their distress. And I mean, I, I, I see the markets, I see all this money playing that is just pure usury. We've talked about that before. I mean, there's, it's one thing to invest in a, a work that is a, a work that is going to produce some good. It's, it's actually productive of some fruit that is beneficial to mankind, but just to play with money, like George Soros does. I mean, that's his whole life, just playing with money. He made one billion dollars in a day breaking the British pound, pound. How much suffering was caused by that? And yet he's crowned as like the, the king of investors for this, you know, because he was able to break the British pound. And uh, he's played with, with national currencies, which has affected thousands, tens of millions of lives, okay? The value of the money is stolen from all of them by what he's done. Basically, in the terms of usury, that's in, in the medieval sense of usury that the church has condemned, that's exactly what happened here. And so, uh, I mean, this, this is uh, endemic, and you look at those who've, who've made millions and millions in this way, I mean, it's nothing but money manipulation is all it is. And... Um, it's evil. It's a sin that cries to heaven for vengeance. And finally, you get down to defrauding the laborers of their wages, you know. And again, I mean, I, I'm going to detail about that, but uh, it happens. There's a lot of it going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's so many ways that that's done. I mean, it's, you've got, don't have enough fingers and toes mm -hmm. to enumerate all the ways that they, they manage to do that. But uh, these are the four sins that cry to heaven for vengeance. And I'd say we're pretty well... Um, uh, invested in every single one of them. Right. We're, we're long overdue on every single one of those. So I can't help but think that we're in it, uh, we're very deeply into uh, divine vengeance here. I'm just praying that this is one warning sign from God. I'm just hoping that God is going to use this as a warning shot to wake us up. And the result of it to make us not only better Americans in the sense that we appreciate the liberties and the blessings God has given us in our country, but also better Catholics too, and make us appreciate now our faith, the Mass, the sacraments. And um, God has ways of getting your attention, and I certainly hope this is, this is simply that, God's way of getting our attention, and that will pass. Definitely. M Mr. Condit, one, one question that I wanted to ask, you know, if, if, um, if this trend does continue, you know, we've seen these 
at least I guess you could call them questionably constitutional um, at best, perhaps, uh, the, these directives and, and orders that we've seen from our governors. If this trend continues, the, the orders become more and more questionable. At, at what point do we draw the line? If our liberties are being infringed upon by, by degrees, at what point do we draw the line? How do, how do we know when we've crossed the point um, where we should actually take action? Well, my first reaction is that might be for a moral theologian, <laughs> which I'm not. There might be one sitting across the table from me. Um, I, I think the, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, when I look at Governor Bashir's order, uh, well, I look, the, the first time they shut down a church, <laughs> I mean, I think that's, I, I think that's, uh, it would be an amazingly brazen act by, by the, the government of any state in this country to, to do that. And um, I think part of it um, may, may be feeding into something we had discussed uh, before we started tonight, um, just w what to make of the order itself and what can, what can we infer from the order? I mean, I, I think it's understood that with a national crisis, a state or national crisis, something on the, that, that civil liberties will be infringed, that the, the greater good requires it, mm -hmm. right? I think everyone understands that in a true emergency. And I think the spirit of most Americans now is, okay, They'll, they'll step back, they'll accept the infringements on some liberty. It's a crisis, let's, let's get past it. Uh, but I, don't, I do think the American spirit's not gonna tolerate it for long, and especially if orders like, in my opinion, Governor uh, Bashir's order in Kentucky is, is sweeping and oppressive, but actually not serious. No, no. And, and, and let me give you a couple of my reactions <laughs> to that as it's written. When you say not serious, that's interesting. In what sense? That they're not seriously trying to combat the epidemic. I see, okay. There's oppressive terms here that are, again, using the word either over-inclusive or under-inclusive for what they're trying, for what they claim they're trying to target mm -hmm. and, and get done that there's serious defects uh, that make you think they're not serious. Let me give you an example. The, the very first thing in the order says, residents of the Commonwealth of Kentucky are instructed not to travel into any other state except, and then it lists the five things. Now, they're short enough, I'll just read them quickly for the viewers. When required by employment to seek groceries, medicine, or other necessary supplies, to seek or obtain care by a licensed health care provider, to provide care for the elderly, minors, dependents, persons with disabilities, or other vulnerable persons, or, number five, when required by court order. All right, so, breaking that down, just, so it's only residents of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, right? That's, that's the only people that the governor purports to bind by this order. They may not leave except for one of those five excuses. And if, if I understood also something I heard uh, maybe as part of this order coming down was that some of the surrounding states and Tennessee in particular had not taken some of the precautions that the state of Kentucky had taken. Mm -hmm. So they're afraid they're going to go into these infected states and then come back. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Nothing here binds residents of the state of Tennessee from coming into <laughs> Kentucky. Mm -hmm. right? So how are, they, how are they serious about this? If they're serious, they would close the border mm. between Kentucky and Tennessee. At this point, under this order, the only people in the United States burdened by this order, and burdened very substantially, are residents of the state of Kentucky. The Commonwealth of Kentucky, I'm sorry. All the members of all the other 49 states, residents of the other 49 states, and indeed illegal aliens and whoever, can come and go into Kentucky. And foreign nationals. No. They're, they're not violating this order to come in and leave, to come in and leave, to come in and leave. Yeah. But the residents of Kentucky better not leave. Now, that tells me they're not serious here. Mm -hmm. They're not serious here. That, and, and then when people start feeling that and sensing that and understanding it, I think their patience will run, run out pretty quickly. Uh, another thing I note about this um, is that Anyone who's outside the state, um, number, two, number two, residents of the Commonwealth of Kentucky currently located in another state 
for a reason other than those identified in the previous section, must upon their return to the Commonwealth of Kentucky self-quarantine for 14 days. All right. So only those outside the state for reasons not justified, only they must come home and self-quarantine. Mm -hmm. Everyone else who leaves for an accepted reason, well, they don't have to ever self-quarantine. <laughs> so are they really serious about this? Or are they just singling out groups and, and, and kind of putting on a show here? Because I don't see any consistency. And indeed, it, to me, if it went into a, a, a court with a constitutional challenge, let's say somebody's arrested trying to cross the bridge to go to church. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm which is a, a separate issue, the religious liberties. Um, um, if someone defended and made a constitutional challenge to whether they could even be bound by this order, one, one concept that prevails in constitutional disputes often is whether a regulation, it could be a local ordinance or a statute or an order like this from the governor. Is the order over-inclusive? Meaning, is it, is it binding people who do not need to be bound by it? There's no justification for binding them. Maybe there's only certain areas that need to be targeted. Or is it under-inclusive, where you're targeting specific people, and that's what I think this one in Kentucky does. You're targeting Kentuckians, but you're not trying to control the conduct of anyone else. Mm. And, no, and, and they're out all mingle, uh, right, the Tennesseans. It's and the like old. you're trying to control the conduct of the virus. In the sense that if people leave for what Andy Bashir thinks is a good reason, the virus is going to give them credit for that. It's, the virus it, will behave. The virus will behave itself when it comes back <laughs> yes. into Kentucky. Yes. It makes a difference. Right? Yes. So it sounds, to, I mean, I guess summing it up, it sounds like Governor Bashir, on the face of this order, I don't want to look into his heart, but on the face of this order, he's trying to control Kentuckians more than he's trying to control the virus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and do you think mm -hmm. we, could, we could even narrow that down a little bit more and say that he, he's trying to control religious Kentuckians specifically? Because, I mean, when you read through the, these exceptions, you know, they, they don't seem, you know, I, I thought num letter B here, number two, was particularly striking. To obtain groceries, medicine, or, or other supply. I mean, I, I've been, been in, to Kentucky many times. There's... there's a plethora of grocery stores over there. Why? Why would somebody yeah. find it absolutely necessary to cross yeah. the border? And, and right, and well, well for but, sale, if they have big having uh, well, so, so. If mean, they can't find any food on the shelves in Kentucky, they might have to go to Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. Or come to Ohio for sure. Yeah. yeah, but the point is, and I think it's true. Every bridge that I know of in Kentucky, and I cross a few. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of grocery stores on both sides of the bridge. So, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but, but I don't think you can accuse them of targeting. I mean, I'm here talking as a lawyer here, of targeting religious groups because he says nothing about them. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of other doggone good reasons why people, other than religion, but religion mm -hmm. would be one of them. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe, look, maybe the overwhelming number of Kentucky residents go to church in Kentucky and don't cross the state line mm -hmm. to go to church. Mm -hmm. As traditional Catholics, we've got a bit of a more unique situation with, mm -hmm. with the who, who gets drawn to go mm -hmm. to Mass here. And, and Tom, on the other it, side it is a fact, however, that when the uh, question of, of shutting things down in Kentucky first arose, the very first thing that came to his, well, the very first thing he expressed as coming to his mind was suggesting that churches needed to close. That was the first thing in line. From Governor Bashir? From Governor Bashir. I, you know, now I had not heard that, so mm -hmm. that's, that's troubling. Sure, that's troubling. Yeah, he wanted the churches to shut down, voluntarily, you know. <laughs> First right. of all. That's my best information, right. anyway. Right. Okay. Mr. Connett, you uh, you know you you started the the program by by reading the the statistics there, um, seemingly indicating that the coronavirus is you know like you said way down on the the totem pole. But let let's say it, it was um, something a lot more serious. Do you think that um, if this was something more serious, that it would uh, ju legally justify? The, uh, the these religious preventing people from from their uh, religious services. Do you think that that it could reasonably, um, you know, shut down churches? Do you think that that would be constitutional if the crisis was actually bad enough? If it was bad enough, 
Now you, you frame that in terms of what's mm -hmm. constitutional. Mm -hmm. If it was really grave, statistically, obviously grave, mm -hmm. that, that people were dying and, pe and some people getting, probably getting it in church were dying, mm -hmm. uh, then I think it probably would be constitutional. Okay. As narrowly targeted and as limited as it could mm -hmm. be. But if it really was literally we're stopping deaths here, mm -hmm. Uh, it probably would be upheld as constitutional, but you know the the, the look religious the, the the right to practice your religion be upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States, I think. or or most lower courts. I mean, addressed. <laughs> okay. with it. If, I mean, here here the law is this: if if it's a fundamental right under the Constitution, and that would be the things we know well: the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom yeah. of the press, mm -hmm. right to bear arms. And now, thanks to the creative U.S. Supreme Court of years gone by. The right to abortion is now declared a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, in the last 24 hours or 48 hours, judges in four different states have ruled in favor of Planned Parenthood because they must be able to stay open. Mm -hmm. right. So that right. fundamental right, that's, you yeah. can't infringe on that one, see. So mm -hmm. I think right away th that, that may help us indirectly because I think if they start coming at churches, we can point, point at Planned Parenthood and these other judicial decisions. Wait a minute, what about our fundamental? Our, unlike their fundamental right, which was created in the penumbras of the Constitution, <laughs> ours is stated explicitly right in the First Amendment. <laughs> so, so we certainly have a fundamental right that, gets, that should be protected at least as much as theirs. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that would be the battle. But, but I, I think if it was, you know, death skyrocketing and really ri it's just ripping through society in huge numbers, I think, I think the courts under current jurisprudence would probably say, okay, that we're gonna uphold this closure of churches, mm -hmm. but it's really gotta be targeted, necessary. I mean, the, the, the law is when you're suppressing a fundamental right, there has to be a substantial or even a compelling, a compelling governmental mm -hmm. interest. Something that's real, not just feared or imagined, mm -hmm. something that's real. Mm -hmm. And if it got that bad, then it would probably be upheld that, uh, that it would be justified constitutionally mm -hmm. as long as it was necessary and no longer. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, Tom, even morally speaking, I mean, the Catholic Church understands and, and, and has taught for, for the very beginning that there are reasons that would uh, exempt one from the obligation to attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days. And there are reasons that would require one to stay away from the church for mass and holy days obligation, if they presented a danger to someone else, or if they uh, if that exposure was imposing a danger on them, if they were endangering themselves gravely, so even before it came to that, really, even before it came to some kind of a court injunction or a, a governor's mandate or whatever, uh, the church herself, if there were a real and present danger in attend attending the mass, the church would let. Her, her people know that you're not obliged to attend Mass, and you might even be obliged not to under the circumstances if, if coming to, to Mass was really a, you know, a real and present danger, right? Um, now, of course, we think back to the Roman imperial times when people would gather in the catacombs and, and other places under threat of death. And they came willingly. They weren't compelled to come. They weren't ordered, you know, you have to be here. Or uh, you're committing a mortal sin if you don't expose yourself to, you know, capture, uh, you know, criminal charges, torture, and death. <laughs> they came out of love and devotion, so they were willing to risk that. And God had given them the grace to do so, right? But the fact is that, uh, you know, we're talking about something temporary. We're talking about not something that is imposed by man so much. We're talking about the circumstances like a pandemic, where there really is a, a danger of death there, that is presented this way, and, and the church has always exempted people from because of serious danger of illness or right. death. So, uh, I mean, the, the, I, I think under those circumstances, the state would not have to impose such a thing. But, I mean, it, what you're saying, I gather, is that the state um, power could impose that under the Constitution of the United States of America, right? Uh, but it would have to be truly legitimate again, according to the terms of the same Constitution of the United States of America. But um, the limitation would be if the danger could be rendered remote in the church, and the church could do something to make the church safe. If, for example, what we did at Immaculate Conception this past Sunday, I think made the church safer, a safer place to be than in their own homes. 
where they're hunkered down together, as it were, with uh, <clears throat> grandma, maybe grandpa, and uh, you know, maybe th two or three generations under the same roof. They're going out shopping. They're going to the gas station and so on and so forth. They're coming back. No one knows exactly how much, what contact they've had with other people. What they've touched in the meantime, they're bringing it home. But people are all enclosed there. And uh, so there is a certain danger in this stay-at-home order, too. Uh, whereas in the church, I mean, we disinfected the pews after every Mass, right? We kept the distance that they required. Um, we were even taking the temperatures uh, digitally. I got mine taken. Really? Yeah. I'm glad you had one. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so did I, actually. Yeah, I took my own, actually. But uh, um, just to try to comply with the state order and do whatever is reasonable. Mm -hmm. you know, whatever is reasonable, and let's face it, I mean, at a time like this, this is just common sense, is what the point I've been making here, is it? These things are just common sense. Washing your hands, now 20 seconds, I don't count, but to wash your hands, to disinfect your hands with sanitizer, to stay away from, you know, somebody who might be ill or a carrier of a disease, um, this is all very basic stuff here, you know. So they're not, they're not demanding any draconian measures be taken, I don't think. Um, but I think people were safer while they were in church, our church last Sunday, when they were, would have been when they went home. Well, and, and Father, you didn't mention that you doubled the number of masses that you know. We doubled have, the number of masses. So mass that everyone could spread out. <clears throat> That's right. Even live streaming the mass into a church, uh, a school auditorium for those who needed to attend there for whatever reason, too. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there, there are on many fronts. I and mean, we're just mentioning a few of the right. things we yeah. did. There are many other things we did, too, about this. So, I mean, if, if the, uh, even if there were a state of crisis like that, if the church could make itself a safe place, again, even there, constitutionally, the state could not shut that down, right? would not have cause to do so. Well, I guess the question constitutionally is, is the state going to be in a position to analyze what every church is doing? I mean, at some point they have to be able to make a broad order, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, uh, Depends how much they're able to to learn. Do you think they should at least uh, establish a protocol and say we want our churches? That's very important that we protect our churches' right to operate and have public worship. And so we're establishing a protocol we want you to follow. That would and, be. I think that would be certainly well received mm -hmm. by by the church goers. To, to uh, and and I think that's yeah. I think the government would have a duty to do that first before they shut down if they can. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, go to the ultimate point, so cycling back, if the directive just come, we're shutting down the churches, and you asked how would people react to that, at what point is it, you know, is it not going to be accepted? Again, if the situation was very grave and an order like that came out, I think, I th I think most people would, and most Christians across the board would accept it. But, you know, not if they say, but the Super Bowl can go on. <laughs> you know, that's the mm. point. Are you really serious or are you just targeting and kind of putting on a show here? Or abortions yeah, can or, go or on. Or abortion clinics can stay open. Mm. Right. I mean, that, that, that's what's going to get people really upset and rebellious mm. if they see this, this inconsistent uh, yeah. or politically targeted uh, or not targeted. Right. You know, you, you mentioned abortions. I, I think um, some could argue that, that uh, abortions are a type of, religious service almost you know it, abortion has been called the the sacrament of the left um right. it's it, there's well documented uh satanic rituals and um and, and things like that, that that take place in these abortion clinics right. uh so <laughs> well forgot, it is interesting <laughs> john from that point of view i mean it's as though the state power even now has been reluctant to deal with the supernatural mm -hmm. uh or the preternatural uh at least some governors closing the churches, closing the abortion clinics, the one from heaven, the other from hell. <laughs> they, <Yeah. they've, laughs> yeah. Even now, I mean, in, in the state of Ohio, um, the abortion clinics have been ordered now for weeks to close down, at, at least, you know, a week and a half, I guess, and they won't do it. Well, a federal they judge in Cincinnati was one of the judges that gave an order allowing them to stay open just in the last 24 hours. Is it just judge, in the last 24 judge hours? Judge Barrett. Uh, is that right? Federal court here in Cincinnati. 
And uh, really there were three other states. I forget which ones they were. So, mm-hmm. so again, ironically, that may be precedent that would help the churches mm-hmm. if they come for the churches. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, 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 that those decisions could, because they are coming after and trying to shut down a fundamental right, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Of, of explicit in the Constitution. And if they have found a reason to allow Planned Parenthood to keep operating <coughs> and not a church, that's when I think. I mean, I. I think you'd see some real rebellion at that point, and for good reason, mm-hmm. for good reason. And Mr. Kind of this, this rebellion, um, you know, if things do keep getting worse, what kind of, as Americans, what kind of practical steps can we take? You know, obviously we can get the, the supernatural um, um, perspective here from, from Father Jenkins, but just as, as everyday Americans, what kind of practical things can we do to fight this, this crisis? <laughs> Well, you're asking a guy who cut his teeth in a courtroom representing the heroes of Operation Rescue. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Civil disobedience yeah. all over the place back in 1989, 1990, 91. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I've, uh, look, and the, to me that's, uh, I've said and others have said, that's, that's the greatest civil disobedience movement in history. Sure. And the most unselfish one because everyone in that movement willing to be arrested had already been born. So what they were doing was not helping themselves. It was yeah. for charity of helping others. That's um, a good point. And, and so I do believe it was the greatest and most peaceful civil disobedience movement in history. And I think that would be the way to go. Go to church and make them carry you out. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it comes to that, uh, it comes to that. that um, you know, I don't know. Okay. Would you defend us? (laughs) (laughs) Well, would I be obliged to lock the door of the church to keep people out if they wanted to come? Could they make me lock the door of the church? I don't think they could make you. They could arrest you. For not locking the door of the church? For allowing people to come? Probably. They'd they'd probably feel that you're the one that's accountable. Mm -hmm. Wow. Father, you know, you... As you know, you'd, in this country, you don't have to be guilty to get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> True. No. Or convicted. That's right. <laughs> uh, Father Jenkins... And you, you can be very guilty and not get arrested. That's, not get arrested. Yeah. that's true, too. Yeah. It's probably worse than, worse than the other way around. Um, Father, you, you mentioned this um, idea, you know, if it's, if it's justified that uh, perhaps the, the church could close its doors and, uh, you know, at least not have public masses. But if, if we don't, um, if the mass is, is taken away from us, Father, at least, at least public masses, would this not be the worst possible punishment that, that God could send us? I mean, I think, you know, if you look back into the, the church's history and in the, the early times, we had the, uh, the early Christians who had their masses in, in the catacombs. They went underground. They had their masses in secret and hiding. But at least they had the Mass. They, they mm-hmm. certainly took a, a lot of effort to attend Mass, but they at least still had the Mass. They had the possibility of attending Mass. Um, it, it seems to me that if, if, this, if things continue to, to progress down this road, they get worse and worse, and you know, we actually don't even have public Masses available at all, would that not put us in a, a, worse, a worse state of things than the early Christians had in the early days? Oh, I, I think it certainly would. Uh, the Church has a... Uh, a punishment called interdict. Yes. She could interdict, well, basically individuals, but mostly populations, even entire nations, mm. uh, because of some great crime committed against the church, against God. And uh, that interdiction applied to the availability of the, the Mass and the sacraments. They were just banned from having access to the Mass and the sacraments. That was always considered to be one of the most terrible punishments uh, the people could, could endure. And, uh, and it had to be imposed only for some extremely grave reasons, you know, out of genuine necessity, but uh, because of horrible abuses, basically. Um, but in this case, God might be imposing that interdict on the entire world, first of all, through the Novus Ordo, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Francis was basically the first one to, to lay down the arms, right? He was the first one to precipitate, uh, just voluntarily saying, we're going to shut the churches of Rome. <clears throat> Not just stop access to the, the Novus Ordo 
liturgies in Rome, we're going to shut, we're going to lock the churches down. And he wasn't asked to do that. Certainly wasn't told to do that. He just volunteered to do that. But that lasted about, oh, I don't know, a day or two. I guess the hue and cry finally convinced him, well, let's open the churches, but people cannot, you know, uh, attend their liturgy. They can't really have access to the sacraments uh, as they normally would, at least in the Novus Ordo. And uh, then, uh, I mean, there were cases where people were trying to watch a Novus Ordo clergyman at a table uh, through an open door of the church, and uh, the Italian police would come and drive them off. They couldn't even stand outside and just look through the door. I mean, that is really, that is, that is awful. You know? I mean, it's the Nova Sordo, I understand that, but, but I, 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 it all comes down in the head of, of, uh, to Francis. I mean, he's responsible for all of that. And then in the, every, every single diocese th is in the United States of America shut down. Every single Nova Sordo diocese shut down. That's what they think of their mass and their sacraments the New Order Mass and, and the, their new sacraments, they shut them all down. They've even proposed the idea that the, their people are fasting during Lent from Mass and sacraments. Wow. Uh, well, they're telling go ahead, go ahead and eat meat anyway yeah. on Fridays because after all you've suffered enough and <laughs> you're doing enough penance. And um, it's, it's a farce. It's, it's, it would be uh, comedy and tragedy together if it weren't if it weren't just so all evil and it is it is evil but they're the ones who basically sig signaled the civil power you can do this because <clears throat> we're certainly not going to oppose you we're going to set the example we're in the forefront we're going to shut down and that's the example they set for everyone and uh, they signal to the other churches you know hey listen this is the way to go they signal to the state house, hey, listen, you know, we're not going to stand up and stop you from doing this, so you have nothing to fear from us. So I, I attribute all of this basically to go right back to Francis. Uh, he's uh, set an awful precedent. Is it surprising? No, he's a modernist. Read St. Pius X's encyclical on the condemning the errors of the modernists, 1907, Pascendi, Domenici Gregis, right? He talks about the modernists <clears throat> fawning almost uh, subservience to the civil law. And the civil power has, has by right legitimate authority to determine how we practice our religion, how we practice our faith in this world. Read it. It's, it's all right there. Francis is the embodiment of that. If you might as well you know, take the pages of, of, of uh, Bashendi, put it in a blender, and puree it, and, and out comes Francis. He's a modernist, right down to his DNA and RNA. Yeah. Father, it, it seems to me, um, perhaps I, I, I could be wrong here, but it seems to me that, that Francis has been a bit uh, uncharacteristically <coughs> silent during, during this whole ordeal. But I did see one, one article, I believe it was posted on LifeSite, where uh, the headline, I believe, was, Pope Blames Coronavirus <coughs> on Nature having a fit over environmental <coughs> damage. Now, you know why that's really interesting? How's that? <coughs> well, they're saying that his Pachamamas, yeah. his Pachamama worship in the Vatican brought this on. Yes. And, <coughs> and if, you, if you follow with this Pachamama stuff, they tell you that Pachamama gets upset when yes. nature is abused, yes. and she shakes, and she gets mad, and she has a fit. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what Francis is saying. Mm -hmm. Nature is doing exactly that. So now you see what his faith really is. He really does believe in Pachamama. He believes that Pachamama is really uh, having a tantrum. That's how he explains this. This is God's work. Well, unless you consider Pachamama God, maybe he does. You correct me if I'm wrong, Father, but it is not the, the uh, religion of the Antichrist. Is that not going to be a, a natural religion where we, we sure. worship nature, we worship man, we worship... Uh, this creation, and I mean, if, if Francis yeah. is saying this, that, that this is the result of, of nature having a fit, then is the next logical step not to make reparation to, uh, to, to nature, to this Mother Earth? Abs absolutely. Mama. Do you yeah. think that something like this will, will, uh, will happen soon? Well, you know, in the old days, they just would, uh, you know, sacrifice children or throw the virgin into the volcano to mm -hmm. pacify the gods who are upset, you know, so... Uh, I don't know that Francis is really ready to pull the plug, you know, pull that one out of the shelf, but uh, I'd say that's that's certainly where it's going, and we're heading right back into the jaws of this this uh, 
very, very hellish paganism, mm -hmm. uh, which actually goes beyond, you know, there's a paganism like that of the Romans, which <clears throat> was, um, well, it wasn't an explicit worship of demons, okay, but there, there's a paganism that is the explicit, explicit worship of demons. And when you pull the Pachamama <laughs> uh, out, out of your suitcase in, in, in Rome, when you come for this uh, synod, and you set it up for worship, and you set it up in front of the entire synod, you know, in front of Francis, I mean, you're getting as close to the satanic as you can get. And uh, then we'll look at the staying that he was carrying, the witch's yeah. staff. I mean, it all goes together. Yep. <clears throat> there are any number of other examples, too, actually. They all fit together, though. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Francis, uh, I think he is the front man in all of this. Look, <clears throat> he's had it's, it's these conferences of the Academy, Pontifical Academy of Sciences. He's hosted these meetings with these big abortionists, these big population control people. <clears throat> these things, his, these seances he's been having in Rome, these synods have been funded by Soros and his, his minions. They've been funded by Soros. So where, where do we think this is going? Where should we expect this is going? Well, I'm afraid it's sure not taking us to heaven, that's for sure. I'm afraid it's taking us to hell before we even get there, <laughs> even now. So I, I just hope people realize that uh, the reason why this is happening is because they have shut out God's grace and we have to begin to, be, we have to be converted. We have to repent of our sins and we have to reform. You have to make amendment we have to stop offending God. Exactly what Our Lady said to Fatima. It's the only answer. Um, you know, people have all kinds of other solutions, you know, uh, um, but it's that moral solution that, 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 that is at the, at the foundation of the whole problem. That we, we've got to deal with that. We've got to face that. Just like Nineveh did long ago, right? We've got to face that problem. Mm -hmm. Well, Father Jenkins, Mr. Condit, I, I think we can uh, perhaps wrap up with that. We've, we've covered a lot, uh, a lot tonight, definitely, and we'll continue to monitor the situation, definitely, and uh, keep our viewers up to date with uh, any new actions that uh, take place. So, uh, Mr. Condit, I'd like to, uh, to thank you for being on the program tonight. You know, I, I find it a bit ironic. It was just, just a matter of weeks ago before uh, all of this kind of really um, you know, kind of, kind of blew up with it. I, I had mentioned to you the, the possibility of coming on the program. We'd like to have you on the program. And I, I remember you, you said something along the lines of, well, if there's some kind of legal issue that pops up. But boy, uh, I think that uh, that definitely came to yeah, pass. Well, as I, as I told you, I was on the show a couple times That's three, right. yep. three or so years ago. And yep. I warrant, give my same warning, don't have lawyers on your show. Too often. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you for being here tonight, Mr. Oh, it's my definitely, pleasure. Definitely my pleasure. And you. thanks for all your pro-life work, too. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And for Operation Rescue, okay. too. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I refer to that as the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the good old days. Okay. Well, hopefully, hopefully, by the grace yeah. of God, we'll have better days yeah. coming. Right. We'll have to pray the rosary and uh, mm -hmm. follow the laws of God. And, and, <laughs> Give up those seven, those, those four cents that cry to heaven for vengeance, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, Tom, our, our Lady really did put it in our hands here that she, she basically put our fate in our own hands, but she told us, here's the rosary, this is what you need to do, pray, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, this, this, if you don't, this is what will happen. If you do, then uh, this is what will happen. There'll be peace, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to realize that uh, the good, the bad news is that it's it's in our very dirty and bloody hands. The good news is that it is in our power to wash those hands. Right? And uh, I think I think the sanitation and the washing and all that other stuff is kind of symbolic of what we need to do spiritually, right? If we would just do that spiritually, that's the solution to the to the real issue here. Okay. So uh, that's, we, we go from pandemic to pandemonium, as I've said before, and uh, that's what we're, people have reason to fear, of, to fear. but uh, we have to go back to God. That's why shutting the churches down is so tragic. The church has faced many, many uh, epidemics, pandemics, and so on before. But one thing that I, I don't see that she's ever done is actually close the churches. Right. Uh, uh, quite the contrary. Yeah. 
to get people to pray more and more. That's what we need to do right now. Well, Father, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your, your leadership, your guidance on this, and uh, thank you for all of the prayers that I know you are praying as well. Thank you for the, uh, the daily sacrifice of the Mass that you offer. I think um, if there's anything that will get us through us through this, mm. it will be the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So I mm. thank you for that. Well, I hope the people uh, who are watching know that they can watch the live stream of the Mass. That's correct on Sundays and often even during weekdays. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. please, uh, please do that. Participate remotely, but spiritually. Make a spiritual communion and adoration of our Lord and thanksgiving and love for Him. Make an act of love for Him mm -hmm. as He comes to show you the love He has for you. Absolutely. Astounding. With that, thank you to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.